And joining us now on the debate for the full hour in New York, New York, Jana Levin, Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Barnard College, and Lawrence Krauss, Foundation Professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University. In Kitchener, Ontario, Neil Chirac, that's him on the right. He's the director of the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics, and Ramon Laflamme, director of the Institute for Quantum Computing at the University of Waterloo. And finally, joining us here in studio, Lee Smolin, theoretical physicist and faculty member at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics, and Marcelo Gleiser, professor of natural history at Dartmouth College. Uh, lady and gentlemen, we've had six politicians on this program at once, six lawyers on this program at once, Six physicists on this program at once? I think I'm afraid. I'm very afraid. Anyway, we'll do our best to get through this hour talking about Stephen Hawking's universe. I want to welcome you all both here in the studio Thank and you. in points beyond to our discussion. Stephen Hawking, of course, coming to the province of Ontario, and we want to use the occasion to talk about what we think we know about the origins of the universe, something that, of course, has preoccupied him for almost all of his 68 years. And just to set the table for the discussion, Let's play a little clip from a documentary about Stephen Hawking. Roll tape, please. The most famous physicist and the face of science itself. The man who said science should read the mind of God. When he speaks with this curious electronic voice, it's almost like some kind of oracle pronouncing on it. And that kind of also puts him in that, that kind of curiously mystical role. And I, th I really think a, man, a great many people see him as that kind of strange, incomprehensible figure who can communicate with the universe. Neil, let me start with you, since Stephen Hawking is coming to your institution. What was his initial discovery, as we consider his contribution to science, that catapulted him into the limelight to begin with? Well, I think there are several discoveries, but... Um one of uh, his first discovery when he was a graduate student uh, doing his PhD was he showed that Einstein's theory of general relativity uh, fails uh, inevitably at the Big Bang singularity, which, which is the point where the current uh, expanding universe uh, emerged from. And so, in a sense, uh, he showed that we, had to, we have to go beyond Einstein's theory as successful as it is, we need more in order to explain the origin of the universe. Can I just understand that, Neil? He proved Albert Einstein wrong? Yes, he did, but uh, only in the sense that Einstein's theory fails in certain regimes. It describes many phenomena around us, many real phenomena in the universe, with uh, incredible accuracy. But when you try to extend it right back to the, the actual event at the beginning of the universe we see today, then Hawking showed that Einstein's theory uh, falls apart. Hmm. Lee, you want to follow up on that? Well, Neil, I think you're talking about the Hawking-Penrose theorem. And I think we, we can explain that what it says is that if you try to ex use the physics of Einstein's equations and the physics that we know of for matter, and extend them backward in time as the universe is becoming smaller and smaller and denser and denser because it's doing the opposite as we go forward in time. There reaches a, a moment or a simultaneity where all quantities become infinite and the Einstein equations don't allow us to understand what happens prior to that. And, and I think that many of us, I think Neil and myself included, are, are then very interested in understanding how in the real world, either through quantum mechanical effects or other effects that are not taken into account in Einstein's equations, the world looked before the Big Bang. Well, let's go what back was before then. the Big Bang. Lawrence, let me bring you in and let's go back. We've, I guess, taken it as a given now that the Big Bang theory is how it all began, but I gather that's a relatively recent development as a theory. How did it become the favored theory? Well, it became the favorite theory because observations agreed with it. Everything we see about the universe tells us there was a Big Bang. There's no doubt about it. Every piece of evidence uh, from the, the universal background of radiation that's permeating the universe at a temperature of about three degrees to the abundance of light elements to, in fact, the fact that we observe the universe expanding all, all tells us if we work backwards, there was a Big Bang. And in fact, what is amazing is we can say with a straight face now that the Big Bang happened 13.72 billion years ago where all those 
figures are significant. I would not have imagined in my life, I think, that we would be able to date the universe so accurately. Janet, the last time that Neil Turek was on this program, he told us a story about a, a relative, or maybe it was a former teacher of his, who came up to him many years after he'd graduated from school and had a two-word question. What banged? Can you help us answer that? Right, well, the, the name can be a bit confusing. It makes it sound like there's both a sound and an explosion in space. But as Lee was describing, uh, the Big Bang is really an expansion of space itself. You can't think of it as an explosion into an existing space and time, but really the beginning of space-time itself. So that confusingly, but, but yet elegantly, the explosion happened everywhere. So the Big Bang is really not just the creation of matter and energy in the universe, but it's the creation of the universe itself. And as Lee was, was describing, it's a big challenge for physicists to try to ask, was this really the first time it happened? Was this really the creation of the universe or an episode um, in, in a history of our universe where really just a patch of it blew off or, or maybe we're part of a greater scheme? Uh, Marcelo, as I ask you to follow up on that, let me just uh, correct the record here. I think I introduced you as a professor of natural history or natural philosophy right. at Dartmouth College, so we right. correct the record. And <laughs> now, follow up on Jen, if you would, and tell us whether the Big Bang really started at all or was just sort of a, a piece um, of the puzzle. Well, no, as far as we can tell right now, it, it, it did. I mean, it is the thing that started it all. And uh, all, as Lawrence said, all the evidence really points towards this explanation. I would just wanted to make one comment about Einstein being wrong or being right. Uh, basically, he was not wrong. You know, he basically, as with every theory in physics, every theory in physics has what we call a limit of validity. You know, it breaks down beyond a certain point. And what Hawking did in the singularity theorems with Penrose was to show that if you carry Einstein's theory to this point where space is compressed to almost zero volume, then essentially the theory breaks down, which is perfectly fine. So he was, given, given what we knew at the time, he was right for the time. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Ramon, let me bring you in at this point. How did scientists imagine the universe before the Big Bang became the working theory? I, I don't think we can imagine what it is really before the Big Bang theory. And in fact, Stephen's, uh, Hawking's comment on it is probably the best one to think about it. It's like asking, what is more north than the North Pole? So <laughs> there's no such answer. And then you cannot say what it is before even time occurred, and before space time really occurred. And I'd like to go back to one of the, uh, the, the first work of uh, Stephen Hawking, the one on uh, the singularity at the beginning of the universe. The interesting point of that work, or an interesting point of that work, is that it did not come because of observation that there was something wrong with Einstein's uh, theory. It came from pure thinking and pushing the limit, as Marcelo said, pushing the limit of the theory. And the theory itself predicts its demise. It predicts that there is something that is going to go wrong, or either the theory itself is wrong, or maybe kind of science cannot kind of ask that question anymore. And that kind of raised question of then, if science is able to explain the beginning of the universe, something else that Einstein's theory of relativity has to take over. Lawrence, you want to follow up? Yeah, I want to, you know, we, we've, we've focused on, on that aspect of the limits of, of Einstein's theory that, that, that uh, Stephen did. But in fact, we haven't really focused on the thing that really made him famous in the community, and, which is another challenge to Einstein's theory, which is the fact that, that black holes, these objects that are so dense that not even light can escape classically, what Stephen showed, and really what made him a household name among physicists, was that in fact if you include the effects of quantum mechanics, black holes appear to radiate. They actually appear to radiate and they may one day evaporate. And if they do, that challenge is not just uh, general relativity, but may be a fundamental challenge to quantum mechanics. And that discovery, that theoretical discovery, that black holes radiate with what's now called Hawking radiation, has really driven the field uh, for the last 30 or 40 years because it presents what could be a paradox that will require us to eventually come up with a theory that will unify gravity and quantum mechanics. And, and it's those kind of paradoxes that push physicists forward. Let's drill a little deeper on this black hole business then because um, Stephen Hawking was involved in a long debate about black holes with an American physicist named Leonard Susskind and we have a little piece of tape here that we can play showing that exchange and then we'll come back and talk some more. Michael Smith, if you would, roll tape.
Stephen Hawking is the evil Knievel of physics. We all decided to take a little walk out in San Francisco on Telegraph Hill. Now, if you know San Francisco, you know that Telegraph Hill is a very steep hill. And Stephen decided to come with us in his powered wheelchair. And we get to the top of Telegraph Hill, and all of a sudden, Stephen is going down Telegraph Hill at 30 miles an hour, screaming, Aah! And we all panicked. We ran after him. We couldn't keep up with him. We get down to the bottom of the hill, and there's Stephen sitting there and smiling and saying, can we find another steeper one that he can try? <laughs> Stephen, in his physics, is very bold, very audacious, in very, very much the same way, he lives his life very fully, and he is the evil Knievel of physics. Like evil Knievel, he sometimes has his crashes. Okay, Lee Smolin, help us understand the disagreement here over the black holes, because clearly Professor Susskind uh, isn't buying on to all of well, l l this. Let me preface this by saying that the part of Stephen's character that I most appreciate and was moved by when I met him as a graduate student is his playfulness. Mm -hmm. And Lenny captured that. He's, he likes to play around, he likes to tease. I think many of his comments have to be taken in, in that light. He's, he's a guy who likes to have fun. Um, the, the discovery that quantum mechanics and general relativity, which are hard to put together, can be put together a little bit so they result in one prediction is the best thing that's happened in the efforts to unify general relativity and quantum mechanics, the most substantial result we have. And it is Stevens' result that black holes radiate at a temperature, and he computed a precise expression for the temperature that black holes radiate. And that's, that's one of the great achievements of, of the last half of the 20th century of science. Um, we unfortunately haven't observed it, but we might observe it if we found a small black hole wandering through the solar system or if one very small black hole was burning very brightly in x-rays. And these have been looked at, looked for, and none of, none of them have been found. So, so I want to preface the discussion of the paradox and the argument and so forth to say this is really solid science. Okay. We all expect to see a black hole radiate if it has a temperature that, in the range that we could see. Now having said that, there is a paradox about what happens to information that falls into a black hole because when black holes radiate, they radiate thermally, which means randomly. And there is a worry that if you threw in a lot of encyclopedias, a lot of DVDs with a lot of information, and what comes out is just heat, the information will get lost. And that contradicts one of the principles of quantum mechanics, that information of a quantum state can never get lost. Now, it's controversial. Um, I, I don't think the controversy is yet settled. Well, Steve, let me go to Neil on this. Neil, weigh in on this as well. What's, wh why is this so controversial in the scientific world? <coughs> it's controversial because quantum mechanics is the most successful physical theory we have. It explains the properties of atoms, of electrons in materials. It's the basis for modern technology. So it's an incredibly powerful uh, area of physics, but um, as Lee says, it's built on the notion that you cannot possibly destroy information, that when in any physical process the information survives in, in one form or another. So the fact that black holes seem at first sight to violate uh, that basic law of quantum mechanics is deeply disturbing to many uh, quantum physicists. Uh, so the two sides of the debate are people who insist that somehow the information must actually come out. So even though you throw in these encyclopedias, the black holes are a bit like a fire, that it burns the encyclopedias, the stuff comes out, but it's really hidden there. Uh, all the inf information is still there in the light and heat uh, coming, coming out of the fire. Um, but uh, other people, like Roger Penrose, for example, believe that the information is truly lost. And in fact, he believes this is a, a sort of fundamental reason for the universe having a single direction in time, that, that the universe always appearing to move forward in time. Marcelo. I just wanted to bring up another interesting point about black holes, which is the following. So you have this black hole, and it's evaporating. Now, remember that at the very heart of a black hole, the laws of general relativity break down again, just like they do at the Big Bang. 
So you could imagine that at the heart of the black hole, you have a point, a singularity in fact, where you have this breakdown. And as the black hole evaporates, you get closer and closer to that singularity. And then, boom, at the point in which it disappears, you have this singularity, this breakdown of the laws of physics exposed. So the big question is, what the heck goes on at that very moment? What is it there in that singularity? Ramon, you've worked with Stephen Hawking, and it apparently took him many years to change his views about black holes. And I've uh, read in some of the research preparing for today's program that he's been described as the most stubborn man in the universe. What's your view of his scientific personality? Oh, he's definitely very stubborn. When he has an idea, he wants to push it to the limit and see. But he's stubborn and at the same time is honest with the equations that gives him, uh, for example, the equation of relativity or the equation of quantum mechanics. He's trying to push the limit of putting these two together and see what are the fundamental implications. And what he discovered with the black hole and radiation is that there was a fundamental tenet that physicists had that is what was going to be broken. Like we believe that energy is conserved, we believe that charge is conserved, and maybe if I translate this in an analogy about a law for accountant, accountant thinks that money is conserved. Like it goes in somewhere, it goes out, and the accountant is to, role is to follow the track of money, and they can find that indeed if a million dollar goes somewhere, a million dollar comes at, back in different forms, products or pay of people and everything. What Stephen said was that there was a law about information which people thought it was going to be conserved. Suddenly, information gets lost. It comes in and sometimes it might not come back. And this is that one of the fundamental assumptions of physicists was this was not going to happen. And he claimed that there was a case where this was going to happen. So it took everybody by surprise that somebody like this with kind of good justification, he challenged the whole community of theoretical physicists to go after that problem and to solve it. Okay, let us, I want to return, let's leave black holes aside for a second, I want to return to the question, did it, let's call it this way, did it have to bang? And we're talking about the creation of the universe, of course, and uh, Jenna, let me start with you on this. Was mm -hmm. the universe inevitable? Did it have to bang? Well, I think it's a very good question. It's one that I think scientists would like to have a very clear scientific answer to. I don't think we know if the universe was inevitable. Um, I don't think we know if our particular configuration of the universe was inevitable. I mean, if we look at the laws of physics in a regime where we can't trust everything we currently understand, we have to wonder if it's possible for the universe to be created with gravity much stronger, even weaker. And that would change the entire landscape of the universe. It would change whether or not galaxies formed and stars formed in galaxies. It would change if um, stars created carbon, which would change whether or not there were planets for carbon-based life forms. And so, so the particular form of our universe may be special. I think it's something that's, that's uh, debated and it's an important question to get at the heart of because it's going to contain clues to that theory beyond um, Einstein and beyond quantum mechanics, that fusion of the two ideas. Lawrence, how about it? Did it have to bang? Well, you know, th sir, th of course, that is the key question. Einstein put it uh, poetically, although he made it seem religious, and it wasn't when he said the, what really interested him whether, was whether God had any choice in the creation of the universe. And what he meant was, is there just one consistent set of laws of physics that makes the universe we see inevitable, or could there be many different kinds of physics which could produce many different universes? And actually, that's a, that's a question that physicists are actually grappling with now. One of the interesting things, though, to me is that, in fact, if you, if, when you include quantum mechanics and the realization that we've discovered that the, essentially the total energy of the universe is zero, which was one of the great discoveries, I think, uh, observational discoveries the last uh, 25 years, then in some sense it's inevitable that you end up with a universe. Namely, if you have empty space, uh, then quantum mechanics will eventually tell you that fluctuations must occur and you'll produce stuff. So a lot of people say, how do you get something from nothing? But in fact, quantum mechanics eventually allows that. So we are, we are, we've learned so much in the last 30 years that we're beginning to grapple with questions like, is our universe inevitable, which may be metaphysical. We may be able to answer as physicists. We may not be. We may be approaching the limits of knowledge. We, we don't know. Hmm. Marcelo? Yes, um, I, it's a great that you said that, Lawrence, because this kind of question, did it have to bang? It's the kind of question that I don't think science is very well suited to answer. How come? 
Well, because, you know, science works according to certain rules, you know, certain ways in which we have to have principles, we have to have laws which are empirically validated, that is, they are tested by experiments. And questions of did it have to happen are sort of beyond the kind of discourse that scientists use to talk about. So you can say that given the certain laws, you know, this universe is probable or not, but to say did it have to, meaning is there a reason for the universe to be here, talks about of purpose. And that is a little bit beyond, I think, what science is about. Lee? Yeah, no, I agree. The Viennese philosopher Rudolf Carnap used to say, why is there something rather than nothing? And that is not a question that even cosmologists, I think, can answer, at least in, in, in the role of a scientist. Um, the questions we can address are stunning and spectacular. So I, I think it's fine to stick to, you know, we can get back to what was the first 10 minutes after the Big Bang, I would be very satisfied if within my lifetime there was empirical confirmation of a hypothesis about the 10 minutes before the Big Bang. <laughs> <laughs> that that seems to, to me is, is audacious enough, but maybe achievable. Jana, come on in. Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, add to that conversation. There have been times where we've realized that there are questions we cannot answer. And we've proven that there are questions we cannot answer. There are limit theorems. So for instance, when people accepted that the speed of light was a fundamental limit, uh, special relativity was created, and, and there were mathematicians who realized that there were facts among numbers that we could never prove within the context of, of just arithmetic itself. So um, I just want to throw out that if there really is a fundamental limit to what we can ever ask about the universe and the origin of the universe, I believe we'll be able to prove that it's a limit. And until it's proven that we can't ask or answer the question, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, open, it's open for um, you know, inquiry. Well, Neil, let me get you in here at this point, because while we've talked about the Big Bang, you're working on something else called the Big Bump. What's that, and why is it different? <laughs> yes, yeah, a good opportunity to mention that there is a candidate theory for going beyond Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is called string theory and M theory. And it's really dominated uh, the field of theoretical physics for the last uh, 10 or 15 years. And out of this new theoretical framework, which really builds upon Einstein's theory, but seems to be much more consistent with quantum mechanics, um, new ways of tackling these difficult questions concerning black holes and the singularity at the beginning of the universe ha have arisen. And so in my own work, for example, I'm trying to use these techniques, these new ideas, to really study the singularity precisely and, uh, and I think these questions of philosophy are actually secondary to us uh, constructing consistent mathematical models which do describe the singularity, the so-called singularity at the beginning of the, the Big Bang, uh, which, which Einstein's theory te and, and Hawking's work tells us is inevitable, but when the, in these extended frameworks actually just becomes a normal physical process. So um, I think we are making progress uh, on these questions. And, and, and issues which once would have been treated as philosoph philosophy are actually now becoming very much a part of mainstream physics, uh, at least on the cutting edge. So one aspect is we develop mathematical models to describe the passage of the universe through the Big Bang singularity. And at the same time, we're designing experiments which will fly in space to detect uh, observable signals from that event. OK, but follow so up and, and I, I tell us about the big bump. What's that? So the big bump, I, I think, uh, as Jana described the Big Bang singularity and uh, Marcello described, in Einstein's theory, it's the moment when all of space is actually uh, shrunk back to a single point, And the density of material in the universe is infinite. And Einstein's equations just uh, fail completely. But when you go to a theory like string theory, uh, which has more dimensions of space than the three uh, which are visible around us, it turns out the big, big Bang singularity looks more like the collision of two uh, three-dimensional worlds with each other. And in that collision, they, so they bump, but they do not shrink to zero size. So mm. there's a different picture in which actually everything is finite, there are no infinities, and, uh, 
and the mathematics seems to make sense. Let's see what Lee says um, on that. So I think what was... Go ahead, yeah. Lee. Yeah, no, well, I think I, I admire that work, and it's, um, you know, another field of research that Stephen Hawking was a pioneer in is the application of quantum mechanics to answer the question of what happened at the Big Bang. We call it quantum cosmology. And, and Neil's work is one direction in quantum cosmology which supports the idea that the Big Bang is not the first moment of time and is a very interesting hypothesis about what it was and what was before it. Um, it's also worth mentioning that with string theory may be right, it may be wrong, but even without string theory, advances in the study of quantum cosmology also lead to the same conclusion. That is, w when people have been able to solve the quantum mechanical equations describing a model of the universe near the, what for general relativity is the singularity, they discover a bump, or sometimes we call it a bounce, that is quantum mechanics removes the infinities and gives you a smooth transition to a phase previously where the universe was contracting and then bounced, we say, and then bumped. <laughs> so um, we, there are many things that we don't know. And, and, and when that happens, scientists take different approaches and we have lively debates and so forth between them. But, but I think it's fair to say that the different serious approaches to this question are all yielding the answer that the Big Bang singularity is removed and replaced by a bounce or a bump. Let's hear what Lawrence Krauss has to say on bounce versus bump, versus bang <laughs> well, versus I think, whatever. Uh, you know, I think, it, you know, Lee said it well, at the, at the, at the limits, we, we should, there's lots of debate at the limits of what we know. And when, we, we, when we're confused, we're confused. And, and we're confused right now, and I think that's fair to say. And, and you know, we don't know what's philosophy and what's physics till we try. But I think what, what we shouldn't give the impression, I think, that we're that close. I think um, um, there's been a lot of work, and, there's, and what it's resulted in, in my opinion, is a lot more confusion at the current time than, than knowledge. And we, we, it's really important that we try all these different approaches to see which ones are most productive. I don't think the jury's in yet in any way. I think um, um, you know, st string theory and M theory are fascinating. All they've led to so far, as far as I can see, is more confusion. Uh, um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You've got to try every approach you can try, and, and we'll see. And I think it's, so people should realize when, when, as Lee said, when people are debating as we are now, it's because we're really, we're really trying lots of different approaches, and, it, in, and all roads are worth trying when, 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 you're, when you're exploring new domain and you don't know where the, where the breakthroughs are going to happen. So it's important that in, in a healthy physics environment that we try lots of different techniques because we just don't know what, where the answer If we knew where the answer was, it wouldn't be any fun, first of all, and, and, and anyone could do it. And we do want to have fun after all. Let me <laughs> quote something here from Stephen Hawking's Brief History of Time. Here we go. There are either many different universes or many different regions of a single universe, each with its own initial configuration and perhaps with its own set of laws and science. In most of these universes, the conditions would not be right for the development of complicated organisms. Only in the few universes that are like ours would intelligent beings develop and ask the question, why is the universe the way we see it? The answer is then simple. If it had been different, we would not be here. Jana, I wonder, let's follow up, uh, Jana, to you first, and then I'll go to Ramon after that. Mm -hmm. is, is Professor Hawking saying that the universe is the way that it is because we're here? Uh, I'm not going to put words in anyone's mouth. I don't think he's saying because we're here, the universe is the way it is. I, I, I think it's more reflective. It's like saying the earth is the way it is because we live, we're here to observe the earth. That would be a little bit backward reasoning. I think really the idea is, look, there's lots of different planets and there's lots of different ways the planets can be. The Earth happens to be the only one in our solar system that's optimal for the emergence of life. So, sure, we're here on the Earth because it's optimal for the emergence of life, which is, which is a little bit different. It's more like saying I'm making a scientific observation about the Earth, that the Earth has water and, and it can retain an atmosphere and that there's carbon um, available to make organic life and that all of those conditions are right for life, so here we are to ask the question. It doesn't mean, however, that all planets are like the Earth. And in fact, maybe there's lots of inhospitable solar systems and worlds out there. And, um, and maybe planets like the Earth are rare. And, and I think that um, 
So, so instead of arguing life abounds and that's why we're here, you say maybe we are special, but the only reason we can ask the question is because we're, we're in a universe that's, that's tuned for the emergence of life. Ramon, how would you respond to the quote? Well, I would first say that we don't know exactly what life is. So we, were, we know one particular form that we have around us today, <clears throat> but maybe there's other ways that life or some variation of it can exist on other planets, other places around the world. What we've learned of all of this is that we are on a very small planet in the middle of one galaxy. There's billions of them around, and the chances of, of having other ways of life in our own universe, the one that we know and see, is probably very large. And indeed, when we push the equations of Einstein's relativity and quantum mechanics put together, there seem to be other possibilities of universe where there's a multitude of things that can happen. So. What Stephen was saying is that there are many, many conditions, and indeed, if the conditions are really wrong, <laughs> we would not be there. So mm -hmm. this is obvious, but it also uh, opens the possibility to many other things happening. Marcelo. I just wanted to take a somewhat different uh, approach on this, which is, um, yes, uh, we're here obviously because, as Jenna said, Earth is a good planet for life. Um, but then there is a very dangerous extrapolation that because Earth is a good planet for life, the universe is good for life. And, uh, and we really don't know that. You know, we cannot say anything for sure right now. The only things we can say for sure, and you have to be very precise about it, is that as far as we can tell, the laws of physics and chemistry are the same across the universe. And that at least 20% of the stars do appear to have planets rotating around it. Now, then you have the question, okay, some of these planets may be close enough to the stars so that you have liquid water. And you know, Raymond said that, that we don't know what life is. Well, the biologists would say that we know a lot about life. And, and maybe there are some speculations about what crazy life forms could be. But if you really stick to what we know, and carbon chemistry is the best biochemistry you can have. So you, know, you can say, oh, maybe there are silicon life forms out there. But that's really very speculative. If life is out there, it's going to need water, it's going to need carbon, it's going to have metabolism, and it's going to obey the laws of natural selection. And so based on these fundamental things, you can say that life is much less common than we think it is, and especially complex multicellular life as we are. So human life, or intelligent life, or even just like things like sponges that have many cells, are much rarer than just like amoeba-like forms in the universe. Lawrence Krauss. Well, I think there are two, there are two things I want to point out. The key question here is really, uh, you know, not, uh, I mean, it's obvious that we live in the universe because we can live in the universe. The question is, are the fundamental parameters of our universe determined by fundamental laws that require them to be the way they are, or is it some kind of selection effect? Namely, there could be many different universes with many different laws of physics, but we observe the laws we do because we couldn't be, live in any other universe. That's the key question. Is it fundamental physics that determines the parameters of our universe, or is physics effectively an environmental science? Is it just an accident of our existence? We don't know the answer to that question. Uh, that question has been posed many times, and every time this, this idea um, that's called the anthropic principle was, was, was promoted, it's, it's generally been wrong. We, we just don't know the answer to that question, but it's a, it, that's, that's the fascinating question. But one of the real problems here, and Raymond, Raymond really uh, alluded to it, I think, and, and I disagree, I think, with Marcello here in some sense, is we really don't know what the possibilities for life are. And I, I find it very facile when people argue that, that the parameters have to be the way they are because we're the only, we're typical of life forms in the universe. I think it's probably myopic. I could imagine many different life forms I have in some of my work, and that could be quite different, that might live in quite different universes. So since we don't even know what life is, it's a little premature to use, it seems to me, life as a condition to determine the natures of the universe, because until we understand more, it's really just talk. I do want to go around the horn on this, but I think, Marcelo, you just got called facile and myopic, so I want to give you a chance <laughs> no, to respond. No, I didn't call him that. Come on. <laughs> I'm just being a little more, co I'm just being a little more conservative, and, and because there are two different lines of, of, of thinking here. One is what I would call the astronomer physicist, which is the big number thing, you know, like, all you need is lots of planets and energy, and then life is going to sprout in different forms that we cannot even think about. And then you have the biologist's approach, which is 
it's not that simple. Biochemistry is inc incredibly complex. You can't just fool around with it as much as you think you can. And so I'm sort of taking this second approach and saying we have to be very careful about playing with the notion that life is all over and there are some crazy life forms. Like even Hawking said something that I was amazed in a, in a recent documentary where he said that there could be lives in the center of stars. And I don't know what he means by that. Hmm. Let me get Neil and then Lee on this as well. Go ahead, Neil. Well, for me, uh, the allusion to the anthropic principle is nothing but an excuse for saying we don't currently know how to understand these problems. We don't know why the laws of physics are the way they are. And so for me, it's not a very productive avenue. And when Stephen refers to it, uh, I try to pull him back to physics and to say, look, we still have work to do. Uh, we have to understand what happens at singularities. We have to understand when our equations uh, of physics, including Einstein's theory of gravity and particle physics, fail. We have to solve those failures, and maybe when we solve them, we'll have a better idea as to why the laws of physics have to be, have to be the way they are. So I think kind of discussing this at a metaphysical level and uh, worrying that we may never explain some things is not a very productive activity. Uh, we should focus on you know, building good theories, testing them experimentally, and, uh, and tackling the diseases we know are present in what we know of, of physics. I mean, what happened at singularity? What, what more pressing question could you, could, you, could you have? And I think until we solve that, you see, everything in the universe came out of the singularity. And if we don't understand singularities, clearly we don't know what determined the form of the universe. So until we tackle, resolve that question, let's not worry about uh, what, the compl wh what all the possible laws of physics might, might be or whether we will ever explain it, uh, anything. Uh, let's deal with some concrete problems. Lee. Yes, I'd, I'd like to follow that by bringing the conversation back and illustrate a contrast between this discussion of the anthropic principle, which I agree doesn't go anywhere, and the discussion about what, what happens at the singularity, what replaces the, quote, big bang with a big bounce or a, or a bump or something. And, and the thing is that when Neil and his colleagues put forward a hypothesis about, quote, the big bump, they emphasize that there are implications for observations that cosmologists make. That's the first thing that they emphasize when they give talks, when they write papers. There are implications, there are predictions for how the sky looks in, in microwave frequencies, which could be different from other theories, which could, there are, if you like, residues that are observable of this possible big bump. And when other people put forward, I was referring to some people working in quantum cosmology who put forward a model, they emphasize and they focus on what are the predictions. Okay. And this is why this is science, because it might be that sometime within our lifetime, as both these theories get better and the observations, which are stunning, continue to get better and better and better, there is a clear tilt towards one scenario or theory of the very early universe, which has a bump or a bounce in it, and a tilt away from others. That is a confirmation by experiment. And that's why this is science. The, the discussion, and it's wide-ranging, uh, unfortunately, across the, the discipline of, of physics and cosmology, of maybe there are many universes, maybe this, maybe that. What we always, those of us who are concerned about that, what we always say is, OK, you know, put up a prediction. What's your prediction? And if you can't put up a prediction, then kindly take your speculations you know, to the wine bar and let us get on with science. Well, I appreciate, uh, I appreciate Neil's admonition that he just gave a moment ago. But Jana, let me try this with you anyway. I wonder which you would prefer. Would you prefer a universe where we are so unique and distinctive that there is nothing else out there except us? Or would you prefer someday to know that ET exists? <laughs> Um, well, the beauty about science is it doesn't matter what my preferred narrative is. You know, that's, that's why I love it, because it, you have to face the harsh reality of whatever's true. So I tend to not bring my beliefs to the table other than, you know, using hunches to pursue um, your best guided sort of intuitions. But, but uh, if I'm pressed, I don't want to be the only creatures out there. I mean, we're a slightly depressing species. We don't have a great track record. You know, we've hardly been here 
a bleep of a second and we're doing some real damage to what we know right now to be the only planet that's definitely hospitable, even if we think there may be others out there. So, um, yeah, so I hope there are other life forms out there and I hope there, um, if they are technologically advanced, that the ideas that technologically advanced civilizations are sort of automatically suicidal are not true. You know, I, I hope that you can have sentient, uh, intelligent life that isn't destructive. Uh, let me get Remo on that question as well. Do you have a preference? Uh, if you look at the history of humanity, and you look only a thousand years ago, we thought we were the center of the universe. And today, nobody will tell you, or no scientist will tell you we are the center of the universe. So if you kind of just put the leap a little bit forward and say, are we the only one in the universe, even if we're not the center, that the probability is probably that we are not, that there is other life forms somewhere different. It might, they might be similar, they might be different, but the chances, it is so vast, it is so big, and maybe that's what we've learned in the last 30, 40 years, that the universe is hugely, humongously big. And if it is, the chances that there's a lonely planet somewhere else in some other galaxy who has similar conditions so that life or some form of life comes in is probably very high. Lawrence, will you weigh in? Yeah, let me be even more quantitative. I mean, it was not just talk. We know that we know a tremendous amount about, about um, the evolution of life on Earth. And, and what's surprising in some sense is that life arose on Earth about as early as the laws of physics allowed it to, within a few hundred million years of the formation of the Earth, the oldest fossils are found. And we know we're a, pr we're a test case that if you have organic materials, sunlight and water, that apparently life can arise. And all of those things exist in profusion in the universe, water, Organic materials, we've discovered complex bases of amino acids in space, certainly starlight. And there are 100 billion stars in our galaxy. There are 100 billion galaxies or 400 billion galaxies in the observable universe. And therefore, it's from, from that perspective, given that life ar appeared to arise so easily on Earth, uh, it's hard to imagine that it hasn't arisen anywhere else. Okay, we're in the home stretch here, but less than 10 minutes to go. And I want to try this. Uh, Marcelo, let me try this with you. Stephen Hawking had hoped to realize the promise of something called unified theory. What is that? <laughs> well, <clears throat> for a serious physicists, a unified theory would simply mean a theory that would describe how the elementary building blocks of matter interact with each other. And so you would have complete knowledge of what these building blocks of matter are and the forces by which they interact and create more complex structures, right? And so, but, so this is what superstring theories, for example, are trying to do now. They are the modern incarnation of, of, of unified field theories. Um, and you may want to ask, you know, is this something that we can actually do, right? And for example, Einstein spent 20 years of his life trying to find this theory, and a lot of very big names did that too. And uh, my, my take on this is that it's, it's a losing battle. How come? And for several reasons. But the main, the main reason is the following. I see Neil. Yeah, Neil's chuckling. I'm well, going to come to him in a second to find out why he's laughing. Uh, well, the reason... You're never going to solve a problem if you say it's a losing oh, battle. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> that is... I'm totally with you. And, but maybe you could uh, hear what I mean. Uh, essentially, the idea is the following, is that we'll never have complete knowledge of all the interactions that exist in nature simply because we'll never have enough tools to probe at all energy levels. So. Everything that we know about the world depends on our instruments. And so there's always room for surprise. So even if you're able with super string theories to build a theory that unifies what we know now, that has absolutely no guarantee that in 30 years from now, there'll be a new tool that reveals something completely unexpected that does not fit into this premise. And so to me, unifying theories are, are works in progress. They're never a final work. Okay, Neil. I'd like to come back on that. Uh, I think Marcelo has it exactly backwards. Uh, our most powerful <laughs> instrument for understanding the universe is in between our ears. Yeah. And uh, the history of theoretical physics has proven time and again that very good ideas uh, coming out of theoretical physics have anticipated the observations rather than the other way around. The observations are crucial in telling us which of our ideas are right or wrong but the actual understanding of the world comes out of thinking about it. And so Einstein's theory of general relativity was conceived well before it was known that the universe had more than one galaxy, uh, let alone that it was expanding. And this theory then within it 
showed uh, that the universe could not sit, sit still. It had to either be expanding or contracting. That was an incredibly uh, powerful prediction, one so powerful that Einstein didn't even realize it. And so later when it was discovered w when the universe was expanding, he said, uh, you know, what a pity I hadn't made that clear that my theory uh, predicts this. And there are many such examples that uh, fundamental theories of the world are not driven by observation. They come out of logic and insight and mathematics inspired by the observation. But really, it's a different realm that lives inside our heads. And one of the most amazing things about physics is that the idea that, that our brains are, in fact, our most, most powerful devices for understanding uh, the universe. Jenna, I think I need you to come in here and referee the dis this dispute. What do you say? <laughs> well, I, you know, I, 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 oh man, I know both these people. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's quite true that, uh, <laughs> that we have preempted a lot of discoveries. I mean, I, I think that our minds are part of the physical system and that our brains are configured to reflect laws of physics and our logical structure didn't just drop in out of nowhere. So I, I really do believe that the, yes, the brain holds a lot of codes and keys to, to um, deciphering the universe. And yet our, our intuition has been um, hit at the knees by things like quantum mechanics that were very counter to our intuition. But, but it is true they, that we had ideas about how to understand these experiments. and. Um, and so I guess I, I would just, instead of refereeing the two, I'm just going to make my own declarations, which is that I think if it turns out that there is no unified theory of everything and there, we really can't go that way, that I, again, I believe we'll be able to prove that we can't go that way. We'll find a, a consistent and mathematical uh, proof that that's not possible. And then everybody will move orthogonally because we'll have to go in a different direction. And that will be fine. It will be accepted and, and we'll move on. But until that happens, I think we have to accept the successes that we've experienced so far in understanding how symmetry and unification have guided the world and, and at least wonder if we can push it further to bring gravity into the fold along with the other forces. I just have to give Jenna an award here for a second because I think in the four years this program has been on the air, I've never yet heard the word orthogonally. So thank you, Jen, oh, for yeah. that. <laughs> this was a first. Sure. Lawrence, come on in. <laughs> well, you know, I, I want to uh, come in a, a, a little bit between what we've heard. I, I think that um, I tend to disagree with Marcello in one sense. I agree with that I think it's unlikely we have a theory of everything. But the, ef but the effort to unify things has, in fact, been very productive over the last uh, hundred years, uh, from electricity and magnetism to the, uh, the electroweak theory, the theory that unified the electromagnetic and weak interactions. That principle has been very, very effective. On the other hand, I want to come in completely disagree with, with Neil. I, I don't <laughs> want to give the impression that we are driven, that physics is driven by people's brains. It isn't. Um, if, you, if you put all the, all the people in this program are theorists, if you put us all in a room and left us here for 20 years to describe the universe, or if we'd never seen it, we would have come up with a universe that's very different than the one we see. Physics is driven by experiment. And, it, and, and the relativity was, general relativity was almost unique in the sense that Einstein, in some sense, was way ahead of the curve, but he wasn't. He was still driven by experimental paradoxes. And it's the experiments that will continue to drive um, our understanding. And in fact, nature is far more imaginative than humans are. That's why science is much more interesting than science fiction, hmm. because nature continues to surprise us in ways that we could never anticipate. Just a few minutes to go. Lee, briefly, if you would. Well, I'm struck that th this discussion, Lawrence referred to confusion, is a characteristic of a time when the questions are changing. Mm -hmm. And the question that we theorists used to face is, what are the laws of physics? And now we have new questions, like why these laws and not other laws? Or why this universe and not other law universes? And, and I was also struck by something that Janice said that I think needs to be answered, a kind of pessimism about we're messing up the planet. And I also feel like this is an era where the questions are changing, not how can we exploit the planet, for a human comfort and wealth, but how do we make a sustainable symbiosis with the planet that, that's, that sustains both? And, and I feel like I, you know, we're just climbing out of the cradle. We'll be fine. It's just a bit messy in the meantime. <laughs> Marcelo. <laughs> right. Uh, just in talking about uh, the notion of unification, so this is what I'm saying is not that I'm anti-unification. I'm anti the idea 
that humans can achieve a final understanding of nature. I think that we need a little more humility in understanding that science is a construction that works together. Intuition, yes, Neil, it's very important, but without our tools, as, as Lawrence very well said, we would have no idea what's going on. So we just have the humility to accept that we understand only so much of the world. Humility is one thing, but never is a very long time. Right? Yes, yes, but I also think that our brains are limited. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we'll invent machines that can be smarter than we are, but with what we have... Yeah. <laughs> Neil, do Sorry, I hear you trying to get in? Just, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's just one thing I want to disagree with, and that is pessimism. Uh, I think it's astonishing that just at the point where um, at the end of the 20th century, uh, our understanding of particle physics reached its pinnacle. I mean, we have this incredible standard model of particle physics that describes in a very coherent theoretical way uh, all of the phenomena at, at a fundamental level, all of the phenomena we see uh, in governing the matter and materials around us. And then just at the point where cosmology, through these new observations combined with theoretical ideas, has, has uh, succeeded in producing a remarkably precise description of the entire universe we see, just at that point, people lose their confidence and they start saying, oh, well, maybe now's the time to give up. Um, I think this is crazy. So there's really only one thing I disagree with, which is pessimism. There is no grounds for pessimism. There is every reason to believe there will be brilliant new ideas, there'll be another Einstein, there'll be another Maxwell, there'll be great new ideas which will be testable and which will lead, which will take the level of our understanding of the universe to new heights. And on that word of optimism, that's where we're going to leave it. I want to thank Neil Turek at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics, Ramon Flam from the University of Waterloo for being there in our Kitchener studios, Lawrence Krauss from Arizona State University who was in our New York studio, Jan Eleven, Barnard College who was in our New York studio, and here in Toronto, Marcelo Gleiser from Dartmouth College and Lee Smolin from the Perim Perimeter Institute. Uh, there was a certain amount of skepticism whether we could do six physicists on one program. <laughs> I think we did okay today, folks, so thanks all very, very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.